Welcome to the Wavingston Clergy Clatch, a weekly online Bible study discussing the upcoming Sunday readings. The conversation is led by the Reverend Sven Van Bars from Abingdon, the very Reverend Gary Barker from Kingston Parish, and myself, the Reverend Scott Parnell of Ware Episcopal Church. Good morning, Gary. Good morning, Sven, and welcome to uh, the Wavingston Clergy Clatch here where we're talking about our upcoming Sunday lectionary readings. This Sunday's lectionary is for the second Sunday of Advent, it comes from Isaiah chapter 40, the letter, the second letter of Peter, and from the opening chapter of Mark's gospel. Well, Gary, would you start us off by reading uh, Isaiah chapter 40? This is the first 11 verses of chapter 40, somewhat familiar, I think. <clears throat> Comfort. O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Well, that's it. <laughs> It's so hard to hear that without singing the tune of O Come, O Come, and Matt, you know, or Comfort, Comfort, you might be the tune I always hear at Christmas. Um, the handle, yeah. Yeah, the handle, yeah. Yeah, it's just so, those words are so beautiful and expressed so well all the time that I know, admit that um, like a lot of familiar texts that we hear many places, I often sort of turn off my brain when it comes on. It's like, oh, comfort, comfort. Oh, yes, that's nice. And I don't listen. But having listened um, to the words more closely as you were reading them, Gary, um, it, it is it's the fullness of what that restoration looks like. It's like the mountains, the flora, the, the grass, the shepherds. And so it's like, it's not just there's hope you're going to be restored. But there is this complete restoration. It's this, it's this on societal level, on geographic level, on, on uh, animal husbandry level, on a personal level. It's like that, that restoration that Isaiah talks about is just so full and every fiber and being is there. And sometimes when I, when I hear the wonderful tune, I can, I can skip over that. I can, I can forget that. And there's such good things to remember. Sorry, I'm still listening to Messiah in my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll leave. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
what stood out to me was um, the the designation in the very last line of gently lead the mother sheep, uh-huh. and that I don't I don't hear that that specific image of the mother sheep being the one that sort of takes obviously takes care of all the the baby sheep, um, but that how how everything sort of points points to God. And I, I hear a little bit of assurance of the role of the church in the world, that I think the, the church, I think, is the mother sheep. And that if Christ is the shepherd leading the mother sheep, then what our responsibility is, is to take care of all the other little sheep that are there with us. And that it seems that the, the delegation of that responsibility, that the shepherd doesn't feed the little sheep, the mother sheep does that the, the roles of the shepherd and the mother sheep are just very different and both necessary. Yeah, yeah I love the images of tenderness. They speak tenderly to Jerusalem and that, um, and that sense that um, God has dealt harshly with Israel in preparation for this. So there's, there's um, in two different places here, it, it speaks of, of God being very hard on, on the people of God to kind of bring them through, but that now that they have come through and, and hopefully learned something in the process, they, they have uh, this beautiful place of tenderness um, and, uh, and, and, and the being held in the bosom of God uh, uh, like a lamb, and uh, that that those that wonderful sense of, um, that I always have when we will finally get to Christmas of of Jesus appearing as as a, a little innocent baby, and the and the the gentleness of the of the the night um, in the midst of all kinds of other stuff going on around. Um, you know, we will have. The slaughter of the innocents. A few days after, we will have, um, you know, all kinds of other nasty, nasty stuff. Uh, and yet, um, there's such a tender beauty um, to to the way the good tidings come. That's the other thing here. The good tidings that are mentioned twice in this passage, I had not realized as I did some preparation for this, but this may be the the place where um, Mark will get his whole idea of gospel, mm-hmm. of good news, um, and uh, and so that that idea of of God always having good news, especially in a world where we live right now, where we have constant news, but ninety nine percent of it seems awful. Um, uh, it, to remember that God's news is. is ultimately always good news. Well, it's also it just to bear in mind, pick up on that theme, Gary, to pick up on the idea that this is, this is written to a people in captivity in Babylon. And yet the writer refers to them as members of the cities of Judah. And so they're not in the cities of Judah. Their identity, however, is being residents of cities where they're not currently living. And so it makes me think about what are the ways in which our identity is not formed from the world around us, but rather from the way that we are before we're in our current situation. And that restoration then, that good news, is that the God who who knew you as you're knit together in mother's womb who, who knew you before you know, all creation um, sets your identity and your, your, your situation doesn't set your identity here. I think of this text a lot with um, the idea of, of how we're being um, restored, that, that hope of, of restoration, that hope of being back in relationship, just like the, the exilic people in Babylon I think of the exile that people are in sometimes here um, with you know, addictions or family dysfunctions or just exiles that perhaps are their own creation or perhaps the ones that they are thrust into. Um, but that way that, that that exile does not define you, 
what what defines you as well be for that beyond that. Um, and so cities of, of Judah, you know, this is good tidings. This is good blessings. I think for, you know, all of us have been those times where we are um, not in the place where we want to be. Whether it is, you know, something, uh, something is personal or something is special, something is special, um, and then be very like, alienating and, and seemingly defining for us. Um, but the message of hope is, no, here's the good news. You're, you're bigger than this. You're, you're, you, and God, who is bigger than that, loves you and calls you back in. Yeah, I, I was, I've been thinking about the, that sort of second paragraph that the voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill made low. That I, I don't necessarily think that that means that we're all supposed to look like Montana, where it's just sort of flat and open and nothing, right? That where the, the valleys are being lifted up and the mountains made low, or for the highway, right? That we just have to give, give God an end to our lives. That we just have to temper a little bit of the heights and we have to sort of make space and fill in just a little bit of the low. And that God seems to just cruise right on in and then changes everything. And that I don't think that means that we, again, become Montana and just become these flat, things that I think we're going to keep some of our individuality, that we're going to keep some of the mountains, we're going to keep some of the valleys, and that we're also all going to be held together by this highway that connects us all. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a big highway. We're not, we're not talking about, you know, little Route 14 mm -hmm. and going through the Matthews or Route 3 going through the Northern Net. We're talking like you know, 95. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I always love how the people on the West Coast call it the, the five, so the 95, the highway. <laughs> and so, yeah, well, it's like what, Route 66 all the way across. Yeah. And that it's going to be the image here that, that all people shall see it together. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and so that it's, it, is, it isn't something that, that takes individual identity away, it, it, it keeps us. But it, but it does bring us together, yeah. um, and and um, that wonderful sense that Christ brings to us that that it's not a matter of of um, deciding who's good enough, uh, uh, but that, that the grace is good enough, uh, and uh, so yeah yeah I just like that that that's another tender image for me. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, Sven, would you like to take us through Second Peter? Sure. One thing I love about Advent, one of the challenges and things I love about Advent is how we we change epistle readings. Whereas instead of having one continuous sort of like, oh, we get to hear from different uh, communities. So let's hear from Second Peter. This is the third chapter, uh, verses eight through fifteen. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of as slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with the loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening coming the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire? But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens, and a new earth where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace without spot or blemish and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. What do you hear? 
that last line, regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Mm -hmm. I, one of the questions that I'm asked a lot is um, basically, well, why doesn't God act today like God did in the Old Testament, right? Wh where's the burning bush? Where, where are the miracles? Where's all this happening? And that Peter seems to be writing to his community to say, look, the fact that God is waiting doesn't mean God isn't there. It means that God's given you the time to grow and to mature and to be ready to step into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And that it's not about God's inaction. It's not a, a deist God that sort of kicked everything into motion and walked away and doesn't care anymore. But rather God is there watching and waiting and there's concern and love and it's it's to give us space to be able to welcome god fully mm -hmm. I, I was thinking about that the isaiah thing too and and what you had said sven about identity uh and not necessarily being connected with where we are we, we, we may be in exile we may be exiles but actually who we are, are people of god and um in, in this passage, it's asked, so who are you supposed to be? Um, and um, it, it seems to me the answer is you're supposed to be the one who's made straight the highway for God. Um, it, it's not a matter of, an, of, of having the correct identity. It's a matter of being open to, to God. Uh, and that once you, you're open to God, um, uh, things happen. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to be that just once, I don't know, like once there's one little trickle, that then there, the cascade's going to come. You just have to give it time. And that mm -hmm. can't seal, you can't seal it. It's like, I guess, like a dam that has a, a break in it. Even if it's just starting out with a little bit of water coming through, eventually the dam will break yeah. and we won't be able to stop the goodness of God. And C.S. Lewis has a wonderful image. He says, you know, I, I let God into my house. I thought we might redecorate just a little bit. And the, the next thing I know, he's throwing out a, a new sunroom to the left and a tower up on the right. And, and, and we're building this whole different place. And, uh, and, uh, it's not what I expected. It's not necessarily even what I wanted, but it, wow. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. That's a great quote, Gary. Thanks for reminding me of that. What about you, Sven? What stood out to you? Well, it, it stood out to me the 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 question you touched on, Scott, and the and the question of you know, when when does God come back? And, and you know, we, we are so impatient with, you know, it, it should be by now. What's keeping God? What's God been doing? Um, as if God has ignored us, as if God has, um, you know, has something else to do somewhere that we are not important. I think that's where the fear is in those questions. Um, but this passage really speaks to God is patiently waiting for you. You're not, <laughs> you, th you think you're waiting for God, but perhaps God is waiting for you. And so it's that is an idea of the shepherd who guides the the mother sheep and everyone home. It's that it's an idea of one who is, who is whose time is is not a concern. Who who's bringing things to the fullness is more of a concern. I think maybe the the story of the Israelites as they left Egypt might be a useful sort of talking point in it, and that. I mean, how sort of Joshua and the Israelites managed to take over Jericho by walking around it and screaming, right? That apparently God has the power to do things like that whenever God sort of desires. Mm -hmm. But yet they spent 40 years in the wilderness because God had some teaching God had to do. Right. And he, they, there needed to be a little reprogramming of people's priorities, and yeah. it's one of my favorite lines in the Old Testament and it's when the, they've just made it out of the promised land and the people are complaining because they don't have cucumbers, <laughs> right? And it's like yes. freedom, worshiping God, slavery and cucumbers. Right. <laughs> are, are we really having this conversation, people? Right. And right. so, but yet the, that's, it seemed God needed to give them a little bit of time to wrap their heads around it and to say, oh, we have a new way of living 
And it makes me wonder, say the Israelites had just marched straight from the Red Sea to Jericho and that was it. What kind of community would have been formed there? Mm -hmm. And how would it have not brought about God's purposes? That how much, I mean, would they have opened a treaty back up with Egypt and then all of a sudden found out that Egypt's territory now extended all the way to the Jordan River? And that would it, they needed to have uh, probably a more firm outlook on the providence of God. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems to only take time. It can't just, it just doesn't magically show up one day. Mm -hmm. So that makes, I, I can't, I don't know I can incorporate this into a sermon, but it makes me think of the story of Wizard of Oz. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, Dorothy, you, you always, you, you had the ruby slippers with you all the time, but the value of going through the journey, and I'm totally talking off the top of my head, so this may be totally heretical, I may disavow it later on, but, but having to go through the journey of, of walking with people and encountering challenges and asking yourself questions about your own identity um, is much more valuable. Mm -hmm. the destination for for her growth i think for ours too i think if, you know the pilgrimage uh is it's about the journey not about the destination so you know if you go to if you go to iona or you go to compostela or you go to rome the value of the Arcanterbury, the value of not is is not getting there it is about the steps that you are taking the, what you're leaving behind what you're learning about yourself as you're going which is the same theme here that we have I think that's, I mean, I, it, hearing that reminds me of the, one of the GOE questions. And for those um, listening, the GOEs are the general ordination exams. And that uh, my, my year, the ethics question was on assisted suicide. Mm. And that, that seems to be one of the things that the church opposes and holds on to is because we can't end the journey prematurely. Yeah. Yeah, that we have that it's about this process and it's not just about us that it's about the work of the community as a whole mm -hmm. and that i i think of the the witness of uh pope john paul ii with his parkinson's and mm -hmm. that sort of his experience of suffering became a uh, symbolic for oh so much more mm -hmm. and for his and for of the love of god for the world mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and transition us to our final reading, which is the opening lines of Mark's gospel. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Nice. One, one of the things that hits me, and Gary, you, you were the one to remind me of this earlier. Um, I remember I was a I, I began my seminary life at a Presbyterian seminary and you're required to take a year of Hebrew and a year of Greek and I wound up liking it. Um, but I, and I still go through my, my flashcards once a year and make sure I'm staying up with a little bit. Um, but I remember one of the lectures on the, the good news here is a, and I'm gonna get messed up, it's a, it's a male participle in the Greek Good, good news is a male participle, so that's just the way it is. In the Hebrew, the glad tidings, which are based on this, is a female, and in the Hebrew is a female 
part of speech because cities are always female. And so you're giving glad tidings to the cities of Judah and that's it. And so, but in these two, it, it's like you have this statement and of these, with these two combined of this good news that's coming, this glad tidings are coming is, is not for an exclusive uh, community. It's for an inclusive community that comes. And so when we hear you know, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, it is good news for all people to hear. Um, and he, although Mark is very, very quick and, and action filled as a gospel, I think those first few words are to think, who is this good news for? Is it for those who are of Hebrew descent? Is it for those who are cast down? Is it for those who are raised up? It's for everybody. Um, and that's the message I, that I first hear with this and, and get into my Greek nerd a little bit. I, I, I'm, I may be still back with Scott's cucumbers and, um, uh, <laughs> and thinking about the, the very last lines in this passage where, where John says, you know, I baptize you with water, but mm -hmm. somebody's coming who's going to give you the spirit of God. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we get so tangled up with the cucumbers. Um, you know, as, as a priest, I can't tell you how many times people look to me and say, give us the truth. And it's like, <laughs> I'm just a cucumber, you know. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm not even worthy to untie the shoes. I, I, I baptize with water. It's the spirit comes the way the spirit comes and and it, it, it it's it's this wonderful gift to me i i we we are in the beginning of our searches for new vestry members and i've had a couple uh, new vestry possibilities say you know i'm not worthy it's like no you're not neither am i neither are any of us that's not what it's about mm -hmm. <laughs> And and, um, and and to be able to begin in that freedom of, of uh, not having to be worthy, but that somehow or other at the same time to be given the spirit of God um, and, to, and to trust that unbelievable, amazing things are possible, not because I'm worthy, not because I've got it right, but because of God. Mm -hmm. So I was going to, the cucumber, this is God talking. Well, this is me talking, but it's God prompting me. I was, I was going to save this for when we get to the Feast of Jesus' baptism in January. But you're not a cucumber, Gary. You're a pickle. And in <laughs> fact, the only non-biblical record of the word to baptize that we have comes from a medical journal and that is how they explain what it means to baptize that you bapto so to wash is to bapto you bapto a cucumber before you cut it up and put it in a salad but you baptizo you baptize a cucumber to turn it to a pickle and that it, it is the fundamental change in the identity of the cucumber. And that it's why anytime I baptize someone, I give them a pickle Christmas tree ornament. And I tell them, remember that you're not a cucumber, you're a pickle. And that you have been fundamentally changed now. Um, and it, it preserves you, it keeps you alive forever. Yeah. No. You're not a cucumber. I love it. I love it. You're a pickle. Yeah. Does that good for watermelon rinds too? <laughs> Careful, we might add chicken feet in there. Jesus talks about chickens a little bit. <laughs> this, uh, yeah, we should we should leave this behind on, yes. on this yes. thing. But I love that image of of. Uh, that you are now preserved and set aside for something, for something better. You're you're savory. You, know, you may you may not may not be kosher. If that's really up to you. But <laughs> yeah, no the that idea of sort of the fundamental change mm -hmm. of who we are. That once we've sort of 
open, I mean, going back to the sort of metaphor of a, a dam and the water starts seeping through, mm -hmm. once there's that little crack, there's nothing you can do to go back on it. Yeah. Um, and, that, and I think that's how God works. That is yeah. the minute we're willing to say, okay, I think there's something to this, game's over. Yeah. Right? It, it, it's already been done. Yeah. Um, and now we just have to take the time to walk through the process. Right. Right. You can't make a cucumber of a pickle. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can't undo it. Yeah. yeah. I love that. So I'll probably bring that back up in January because it's my go to baptism <laughs> story. I, I will I will relish it if you bring it up in January. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that wow. <laughs> We should probably end that right there. Then. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> Maybe so. Well, let me, I'll, I will pray us out with the collect for this Sunday. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Merciful God, who sent your messengers of prophets to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation. Give us grace to heed their warnings and forsake our sins, that we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 All righty. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Spin. And I hope you all have a great week, and we'll be back next week. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Gary. See you then. Bye.